Her Majesty's Prison Pentridge, 1965. A maximum security facility in the heart of Melbourne, Victoria. The state's oldest and toughest prison. Inside its blue stone walls, Victoria's most notorious and dangerous criminals. 1,500 inmates held in cramped 3 meter by 1.9 meter cells, watched by 250 guards. It was a cold, hard place. And the system in the early days was very tough. Inside B Division, 40-year-old Ronald Joseph Ryan, a career criminal convicted of robbery and safe blowings. Sentence, eight years. A violent and impoverished childhood, his life of crime began early. Essentially, he had a criminal personality. He'd uh, committed offences from the age of 11. He wasn't happy because he was doing an uh, eight-year stretch. And uh, he had to sort of get his mind around that. And uh, didn't mix with many prisoners. To make matters worse, his latest stint in jail cost him his family. Dorothy had had enough by then. She didn't want this kind of life to affect the, the raising of the girls. Desperate to win his family back, Ryan is determined to escape. And knowing that he needs an accomplice, he approaches fellow prisoner, Peter Walker. I think we just came out one day by talking, you know, we just, um, what do you think about having to go getting out? And being young and full of vigor in them days, so sort of, uh, yeah, why not? At 23, Peter John Walker was a violent criminal, convicted of armed robbery and shooting with intent to cause grievous bodily harm. Peter Walker was not a very nice prisoner. He was in love with himself. If there was a mirror, he'd be looking at it all day. Very fit, uh, somewhat aggressive. Ryan and Walker constructed an escape plan. Actually, we were sitting in the yard and Ronnie pointed up at the chair and he said, what do you think about going through there? And I looked up and all I could see was his guards standing on top of a tower. And I said to him, she's a bit bloody rude, you know, going through there. And he said, well, take a look at it and what do you think? And over the, a few weeks, looking at it, it looked feasible. You know, it could be done. Just before 2 p.m. on the 19th of December, 1965, the 1,500 inmates were being watched by a skeleton staff. It was the day of the prison officer's annual Christmas lunch. What happened next would shock the nation. You, why not? You know, what did you have to lose? 12 years was a long time for a, you know, a 22, 23-year-old bloke. On December the 19th, 1965, Ryan and Walker are ready. Unsupervised in exercise yard B, and using socks on their hands to protect them from the barbed wire on top, the two prisoners hurl themselves up and over the wall. But they aren't out yet. The next challenge is an even higher second blue stone wall, over five meters tall. Above, Warder Helmut Langer is on duty in guard tower number one post. Ryan and Walker pull bed sheets from beneath their clothes. Attaching the sheets to a hook they'd fashioned from scrap metal, they throw their grappling iron over pipes at the top of the wall. Silently, they begin their five metre climb to freedom. There would have been a great amount of uh, fear and uh, bravado, I guess. To distract Officer Langer, an accomplice in the yard creates a diversion at the critical moment. When he turns around, Langer comes face to face with Ryan and Walker. Hands up now, I'm serious. Keep Ryan up. grabs Langer's rifle and orders him to pull the lever, which will open the gate below. Horrifying. It's a terrible situation for him to be in. When someone's got a rifle pointing at you, you know, is he going to pull the trigger or is he not? You say to yourself, this is it, I'm gone. Get down! Ryan and Walker force Helmut Langer down to the outside gate at gunpoint. Come on, keep it going! Open the door. Open it. But it's a trick. You pulled the wrong lever! Bravely, Langer has pulled the wrong lever. 
the gate is still locked. Come on, stop fucking up! Ryan forces Langer back up the tower to pull the correct lever. Ryan runs back down to the open gate as Langer raises the alarm. It was a scene of high drama and anxiety on the part of prison officers. When prisoners are escaping, nothing gets in their way. And unfortunately, they had repossession of an M1 carbine, automatic rifle. Then I looked up at the bloke in the tower was aiming at me. Well, it's very hard to put it in words. You know, it's, it's just actions in split seconds that are going off one after the other. Then George Hodson's materialised wherever he came from. Prison officer Hodson tackles Walker to the ground as Ryan attempts to hijack a passing car. Another guard, Robert Patterson, dashes out of the prison and takes aim at Ryan from behind. Ryan raises the carbine. A single gunshot rings out. The question of who fired the shot would plague the nation for decades to come. 41-year-old prison guard George Hodson was attempting to recapture the escapees. He was unarmed. A single bullet ended his life. 13 eyewitnesses all testify that, you know, Ryan caused the... fired the shot. Well, I don't think Ryan shot at all. You don't think he fired a no, shot? not at all. See, the whole thing is that he'd been fooling around with the gun on the road because he left an alive round of ammunition on the road. So that meant that there would have to have been something wrong with the gun. It was jammed or something like that. As Hodson lies bleeding to death, Ryan and Walker commandeer a getaway car and escape. Prison authorities give chase, but the escapees vanish. Police say that the two escapees are violent criminals made doubly dangerous by desperation. The biggest manhunt in Victoria's history is underway. Ryan and Walker go from hideout to hideout as they become more desperate for money. Well, I must admit we were going to rob banks. There was, there's no way of getting around that. We certainly couldn't thumb a lift over to Brazil. We, we were just going to have to do it. And we did rob one. He herded them into the strong room, essentially, and told the staff that this was a weapon that had killed a man and that they needed to behave and do exactly what they were told. I walked into the bank to pay in some money and a young fellow bobbed up from the teller's desk and said, don't move or I'll shoot. I thought it was a crit joke and I thought, what a funny Christmas joke. But then a, an elder man came from the vault where he'd just locked the staff in, evidently, and he said, yes, that's right, lady, we're the SPs and we're desperate. And he said, we definitely really will shoot, Sheriff. On Christmas Day, 1965, 24-year-old father of two, Arthur James Henderson, recognises the escapees and threatens to turn them in. I hit him with the gun. Uh, there was the explosion. He was dead. Now, I've come back and I've said to him, look, I think he's dead. Well, I didn't know he was dead at the time. I thought he was, you know, um, because I didn't wait around. I don't think they can achieve much at all now. They're escaped convicts. There are two murders credited to them, and... Uh, I can't see what future there is before them at all. Parents were keeping their teenage children at home, uh, not allowing them to go to parties, uh, as there were numerous sightings of Ryan and Walker. On New Year's Day, the authorities receive a tip-off that Ryan and Walker are heading north to New South Wales. We figured that the easiest way, maybe, to get out would be to go the way that you'd be at least expected to go, and it was straight up the Hume Highway right up through everything, through the middle of it. Roadblocks or anything else that was in the way. Did Ryan ever talk to you about, if you were stopped, what you would do? Yeah, bail out and go like hell. <laughs> that was what we said. We were very uh, determined to catch them and uh, return them to Victoria to get them to hell out of New South Wales because we have enough trouble here with our own criminals without them coming from interstate. You still had a gun at the stage? Yeah, we were armed. Yeah. Prepared to use? At that stage, I would say yes. Because at that stage, we were sort of on hot bricks. Hello, is that the police? Yes. No, Ronald Ryan just came to my house. Then, 
On the 4th of January, the police have a breakthrough. They're tipped off that Ryan and Walker have arranged a double date with a couple of nurses. He said, will you get me a girlfriend so we could go out and have a good time? We then realised that they were in need of female company and probably they would be there. At 2.30pm on January the 5th, a team of 50 police officers begin to arrive in Hospital Road to set the trap for Ryan and Walker's arrival. They disconnect public phones and warn the owner of the shop across the road about Ryan and Walker's imminent arrival. They said, uh, you know, don't tell anyone. I said, no, I won't tell anyone. It's only me here. And uh, that's why I didn't tell the wife or anybody. I wasn't uh, really concerned, but I thought he'd... If I tell my wife, she'll probably get a bit upset. Undercover police officers escort the nurses to the designated meeting place. With the trap set, all the police can do now is wait. South Central... It's the surveillance groups to be placed in Concord Road in uh, unmarked police vehicles. We had police in various houses leading down Hospital Road. We had police inside and around the whole of the area there. And a group of about 10 of us, whose task was, when they arrived, to arrest them. Ryan and Walker are due to rendezvous with two nurses at 9pm. But after 20 minutes, there's still no sign of the escapees. And police move the girls from the meeting point. Then, at 9.30, a surveillance crew spot the escapees heading towards the hospital. A car came around and swerved round into Hospital Road, driving at a fair bat, and was down at the hospital within uh, a matter of uh, less than one minute. There was a scattered like you'd never seen of police around Hospital Road, as they all went back into their positions, so that when they arrived, it was a deserted scene. Ryan gets out of the car, can't see the women, so goes to use a payphone to call them. When it doesn't work, he enters Tom's shop. And he just said, can I use your phone, please? I says, yes, it's over there. So he used the phone, and uh, after he used the phone, he asked me how much it was, and I said, sixpence. And, and then he walked out, and as soon as he got onto the footpath, the, uh, the police just uh, grabbed him. Walker is still in the car when two unmarked police vehicles block him front and back. Ross Nixon immediately arrests him. We then uh, grabbed him and have a sure that he came out of that car like a rocket. You look back at it and it's, it's almost like a play. In your mind, you're sort of not believing it's true, but you know that this is actually happening. And then you, you, you've got somebody sitting up there and he, he puts a piece of black cloth on his head and he, he sentences your, your friend to death. And... What was his attitude then? Shock? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I don't think we spoke any words. I you think we just grabbed each other's hand. How did you know he'd been sentenced to death? <laughs> he didn't tell you? No, he didn't have to. As soon as they said the, uh, you were guilty of murder, and I knew what, you know, was a death penalty. 30th of March, 1966. Ronald Ryan is found guilty of the murder of George Hudson and is sentenced to death by hanging. The decision prompts protests across the nation. I don't believe the death penalty was the answer. He only had 13 months from the beginning to the end to um, think about what, you know, his actions. But I've got no time for these murderous mugs who escaped and shot an innocent warder outside of the Pentridge jail. Peter Walker is convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to 24 years for the deaths of Hodson and Henderson. He was released 19 years later on the 21st of December, 1984, and now lives in rural Victoria. At 8 a.m., at 8 a.m. on the 3rd of February, 1967, Ronald Ryan was executed. 
here is a special news.